Today on Locked On Canadians, what even was happening at the end of that Habs game? You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 1010 of Locked On Canadians. I'm going to stop, Scott. I'm no, 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 no. This. Please keep please keep going. I have a very funny stat for this show, I promise. <laughs> no, I'm going to start again. No, no, no. Keep it on. Keep going. Just roll with it. We're rolling with this. <laughs> We're getting, like, really into this episode. All right. Uh, <laughs> it is episode 1010, everybody. This is Locked On Canadians. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where you get your team every single day. Um, and today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. My name is Laura Sab, also known as the Active Stick, and I'm joined by Scott Matla, who is dying laughing. Scott, can you please elaborate as to why you started this episode giggling and throwing me off? <laughs> this is a tweet from Stat Center on Twitter. Fewest saves required by a Montreal Canadiens goalie in a shutout performance since the NHL began save tracking in 1955. 12 by Dennis Haran in 1980 versus Calgary. 12 by Patrick Waugh, November 11th, 1991 versus Edmonton. 13, Jacques Plante, December 15th, 1957 versus Chicago. 13 saves. Caden Primo on tonight <laughs> against the Anaheim Ducks. So if you want to know how this game went, Caden Primo basically took a nap for two and a half hours, got his first NHL shutout, and a whole bunch of other nonsense <laughs> ensued. But that, I'm sorry, that tweet's so funny to me because I thought, oh, the Ducks were even with the Habs going into the at the end of the first period and ended with 13 shots. They had six in the first period. They also, ended with 13. Of which four were from Logan Cooley. No, Logan Cooley plays for Arizona. <laughs> I, now I have to start this episode again. No, you do not. You do not okay, have to start this episode I, over. I, I just, this episode has gone so off the rails, I might edit out this part of it. <laughs> uh, the Anaheim Ducks had three shots from Leo Carlson, two Leo from Carlson Sam Carey. Leo Carlson is who I was thinking about. Well, it's an LC, so like I'll give you cra- I'll give you a pass on on that. So um. I just this was a domination. There has not been a worse game played by an opposing team at the Bell Center in a long time. The Canadians put up 38 shots, led by Cole Caulfield with eight because he's ridiculous, allowed 13, and this was a game that they just they bullied. The Anaheim Ducks, like the across in every facet, the Montreal Canadiens bully the Ducks. This game ended five nothing, and we will talk about Slavkovsky and Suzuki later on in this because that's the most important part. But this is the most fun I've had watching a Habs game in a hot minute because this is, and I know the Ducks are terrible. I know well, the Ducks yes. are bad. Also, um, everybody who pointed out that Trevor Zegers is out, we're so sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know anything about our lives right now, but it's actually insane. Like, we literally are barely keeping up with the Montreal Canadiens. So, I don't have time um, to pay attention to a team that is worse than the one that I am already covering and is already <laughs> bottom five in the NHL. Please cut me some slack on that. Yeah, I am it's sorry. Just, it's it's not an excuse, but we are we are going through some stuff right now. Um, but at the same time, as you can tell from all our giggling, at the same time, I mean, this was a Zegers free uh, Anaheim Ducks lineup, <laughs> but um, it was still it was still the, like the game itself was really fun. But also, we cannot discount Brennan Jiniak because I really want to shout him out. Like he worked so so hard. It's just so heartwarming to see him get his first NHL goal. And it was beautiful. Caden Gooley through the neutral zone, steals the puck, and has the wherewithal not to just try and roof it himself. He sees he's got a two-on-nothing with Brandon Jiniak, feeds him, and Jiniak doesn't squeak one by, 
doesn't flub it into the net. He roofed that thing by Lucas Dostal, who got hung out to dry in this game there. I feel and really he, bad for him. I, I feel awful for him. And then I'm just looking at his reaction where he is so happy with that goal. It finally happened. Even if the Habs were losing, had lost this game for whatever reason, that moment makes things so worth it. And then I, I clipped it on the bench. He goes over there. Suzuki's patting him on the head and Yuri Slavkovsky's tickling him by the chin. This is still a Habs team that's going to finish in the bottom five, six, seven, whatever. But the vibes are unmatched on this team. This team loves playing for each other and loves to celebrate these moments that are coming in here. And that is a, it's a huge deal. I, I know that winning games is important stats and this and that the vibes on this team are unmatched so much right now. And I can't help, but just be so happy uh, for guys on this team. And I'm actually looking here. Uh, where is Brandon Jinyak played, you know, a little over 10 and a half minutes tonight. Got his first NHL goal. Absolutely love that for him. Very few Habs without a point tonight, but everybody on this team was legitimately great. I, uh, I'm not gonna. I I have zero things to complain about in this. I I am so happy that this game turned out the way that it did. It was starting to get a little bit monotonous, all the losses and and frustrating. And you know, we know at the end of the day, this team is not going to do well, right? And and people were up in arms over. I want to say it was it was Jonathan Kovacevic that was saying, you know, we're looking at the stat lines. We're in it to make to win. We're in it to try and make the playoffs and stuff like that. Athletes are hardwired that way. That's just the way they work. You cannot convince them willingly to lose. You cannot convince Martin St. Louis willingly to lose. Like this is not, it's just not the way professional or elite athletes work. They do not, they can take a night off once in a while, but they do not ever uh, take their foot off the gas when they're trying to play. And, you know, as much as tanking goes, like that's why the way to tank is to get rid of your good players. That's literally <laughs> the only way you can do it. And the Habs know that, you know, they've got a long, long way to go. They know that this team is going to look very different two years from now. There's a lot of these guys that they're playing alongside that aren't going to be there. Um, so for them to, like, understand and put weight on those moments like Gignac's first goal and to talk about each other and praise each other the way that that top line has been, you know, to take notice of each other and to develop a chemistry that they're able to play to each other's strengths, especially for the people who you know will be around or most likely will be around, you know, your Nick Suzuki's and your Slavkovsky's, which we are going to talk about in the next segment. But this game is essentially, it's sometimes you just need one of those, right? Sometimes you just need a break. Like you need somebody to give you a break. And then in cases like with, with teams like this, where night in and night out, they're not necessarily able to put together a good performance. Sometimes you just need that win. You need that easy I, I don't want to, I don't even want to say easy like I want to oh, say no no Laura this was this was an easy win there were 13 <laughs> shots against Caden Gooley or Caden Caden Primo in this game and, I was gonna uh, say the Ducks are so bad they put Gooley in goal <laughs> I mean it wouldn't be the worst thing we've seen and I think that you're right is that sometimes you just need I know that people want this team to lose games because you lose and you go down the rankings and you end up in a better spot for the first overall pick. You're slacking for Macklin. You're doing whatever. But sometimes you got to win the games that you should win. We look, remember, this could have been just like that Sharks game where I said it was the most inexcusable loss of Martin St. Louis tenure in Montreal. This was the opposite of that. This is a team that got embarrassed on Sunday, felt that, and came out and took it off took it out on somebody all the way through this. You have guys who are throwing down to defend their teammates, to defend themselves, that everything matters in this. Every moment matters towards something. And they have the Rangers coming up on Thursday. And I know Laura will be having an episode with our lockdown Rangers friend, uh, John as well. These things matter. They might get blown out against the Rangers, but you know what? This is still a building block in this season. This is the kind of thing that you look at and go, Hell yeah, dude. Things are going to be all right. You know, they can play like this. Uh, I'd be more concerned if they went into this game and they like 50-50 played the Ducks and barely escaped with a win like they did in November. This is the kind of win you want to see from a team coming off a bad loss. And I'm glad to see that they seemingly took that loss personally uh, for our Ducks friends. 
sorry. <laughs> uh, but that's just the way she goes sometimes. It is. And speaking of those building blocks, we have been noticing recently that the power play is getting better. Um, so we're going to talk about how our future stars or already stars are contributing to that. And that's all coming up in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. But first, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Let me ask you this. How often are you trying to get tickets to a big event in your town that's near you and you can't find it? Whether it is theater tickets, whether it is a comedian, whether it is music, whether it is sports, and you're scrambling and you know you've missed the boats on the initial run and it's the last minute and you can't find anything. Well, let me tell you that that is a thing of the past because now there's game time. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And the all-in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. You can buy seconds tickets in seconds with two taps and game time has the deals right up to the start of the event, and even an hour within the event. It is the place to find your last minute seats. There's so much that's good about it. There's flash deals, there's zone deals. Check out Game Time because honestly, it will take all the guesswork out of buying tickets. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D. O N for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Scott, let's talk about this power play. So I've noticed that people have been kind of noticing that there's been a slight improvement game over game in the Habs power play in that it's not amazing, but it no longer makes us want to. Redacted. I can't even say it anymore. Redacted. Yes, redacted. yes. It no longer makes us want to redact it. Um, so let's talk about that. And I think one big thing is, and, and I don't know why it took me a while to kind of realize that, and it's because Slavkovsky is coming into his own and they're giving him some freedom on that power play. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is if we're, if we're talking specifically the Ducks game, the Canadians got two power play goals out of six power play opportunities tonight operating at 33%. They are, I don't know if NHL.com is updated with this. They were sitting at 19.4%, at least going into this game. Good for 19th in the NHL just below middle of the pack, which is all that you and I asked for on this team here. And the biggest part with this is it's like you said, is that the Canadians are figuring out a way to utilize. And it's mostly a top unit at this point. They really don't run a power play two because they don't really have uh, bodies for a power play two there. You'll see Pearson. You'll see Anderson. You'll see Yolan and uh, Joshua Wah. Probably Jake Evans is the center on that. And then Jack I or Gooley or whomever at the point, but it is not a unit that you're going to expect a lot out of. It's a play the final 15 seconds. Don't get scored on kind of unit. The movement on everything is crisp and it's the three. And then you could say Monahan and now Alex Newhook in that fourth spot there. Those forwards are the ones making everything happen. Caulfield is playing off to the left side. You have Suzuki operating around the net, and you have Slavkovsky on the right-hand side, uh, inside that face-off dot. If I'm facing that back wall there, and everything is crisp, and if there are loose pucks, they are moving it quickly to a person, to a passing lane. They aren't trying to force pucks in through tiny cracks. They're making the reads that you want to see, and they're using what's called the Royal road in the power play terms. And uh, Shana Goldman, our good friend of our show and at the athletic has talked a lot about this is that when you're operating in that home plate Royal road area, every time you were crossing there, you're making goaltenders move, you're making penalty killers move and you're opening opportunities up. Look at their goals tonight. They were scored by moving the puck back and forth constantly across that line. And nobody is getting set. 
Suzuki finishes one off there, and Slavkovsky's is by the puck going back across off a rebound chance. As the defense scrambles, it, they get looser, and they are opening up space. And we have seen them take advantage of that time and time again this season. And it is such a huge boon for someone like Uri Slavkovsky that he has that confidence. And we now know he is a top unit power play person here. Not which only with we his wanted shot, from him, which is what we needed him to see in him. And we were screaming this last year. And at the start of this year, get him in that spot. He has that chemistry with the top line now. And yeah, Cole Caulfield's maybe not shooting the lights out like he normally does, but he's got 25 assists on the season. It's a pretty good thing for a guy who is a one, allegedly a one-trick pony. Suzuki's up to 32 assists on the season and is up to 19 goals. He's trending just below a point per game on a lottery team right now. And you have Slavkovsky, who's in his last 10 games, has matched his entire production from last year. And it's because, like you said, this power play unit is finding all the chemistry in the world along there. And it's not always pretty. They don't always score power play goals. And that's okay because you see the process of why it's working. And Ian Boisvert pointed this out, that if Mike Matheson was a lefty and when he is passing and his back is not to Uri Slavkovsky, you would see the puck be going into Slavkovsky's wheelhouse more than Caulfield on the power play. And you might see a similar kind of production flip there. More goals from Slavkovsky or more assists and Caulfield getting those scrambling rebound follow-up chances there. But the power play looks brand new. It's nothing special, but it looks but so much different. it's also still hard to defend against, right? Like that's the key thing is it's not, it's not out of this world reinventing the wheel, but it is incrementally or exponentially more difficult to defend against than it used to be. And I think that's the biggest thing is that yeah, it is one unit, but that one unit is getting pretty damn good at what it does there. And it's transitioning even to five-on-five five play. We've seen that top line continue to be almost unstoppable at five-on-five. Five. They will get on the board at some point. Suzuki's on an eight-game point streak. Slavkovsky's on a six-game point streak. Caulfield's point streak ended against the Blues, and he got an assist tonight and is back at it again. It's a unit that is thriving right now. And again, in this season, that is what we wanted to see. We would want to see if this was Kirby Doc out there, if he was healthy. If, you know, guys like Harvey Pinard or Jordan Harris, et cetera, are, if these guys can continue to be building on last year. We're working with what we have right now, and that top line is phenomenal. I'm not going to say they're one of the best in the NHL, but right now they are definitely one of the hottest and it's it's hard to stop them because they have just have found that synergy. And if you take a penalty, guess what? Now you got to defend them down a man too. It's easier said than done. And I don't know if it was Martin St. Louis or Alex Burrows or if it's Adam Nicholas and the coaching staff. Whoever kind of got all these guys trending on that same page there is worth every penny to this organization because they are – salvaging a lot out of what would be a lost season for a lot of teams with the injuries this team has suffered. Absolutely. And and that's the thing. It's like the luxury is kind of that this was going to be a lost season anyway. Um, and there's still a possibility of getting a high pick. Normally a lost season is you finish just outside the playoffs. And it's like that, that really like that, that zone of death that I used to call it. Um, the zone of doom, sorry, uh, where you're not good enough to make the playoffs and you're not bad enough to get the best pick. Um, in the meantime, we do want to talk about the ending of that game, particularly since uh, suspension news has been handed down at the time that we're recording this. Um, and we're going to get into that in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel America's number one sports book. I mean, the Super Bowl is now over. We've done all of our prop betting about that. We've done all of our, you know, our parlays about football, but there's still lots of sports going on, including the NHL, the NBA, the MLB is about to come back. And right now, new customers will get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. 
Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And us. All right. So, Scott, um, <laughs> it was really funny when we were talking about what we wanted to talk about before the end of the game. I think there was maybe like five or six minutes left um, in that third period there. And then I like went to go to the washroom and then went to set up to record. Um, and then Scott was like, I want to talk about whatever the hell that was that happened at the end of the game. And I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so should we lead in with Morgan Riley was handed a five game suspension for his actions in the whole, uh, Ridley Gregg scoring a goal, like a normal person stopping being insane thing. I think it's two games too light, but the whole but the thing whole this week is against the, it, it's against the Leafs. They're out to get the Leafs. Yes, noted Leafs uh, hater George Peros. You're all insane. Anyways, like the talk has been around the code and respecting people. And when a game is out of hand, not doing anything ridiculous or stupid or anything like that. Uh, someone asked Samuel Montembeau about it today, too. And he's a goaltender who you think would probably feel the most strong about being disrespected in a game. And he went, there's not a problem with it. You have a problem with him. You just kind of grab him. You don't need to cross check him up by the ears. And I go, that man is correct. It's the only good player opinion I've seen this week on anything. Uh, but it kind of brings us back to this Habs-Ducks game. Uh, this was a game that was a blowout, was not close, basically from the second period onwards. The Canadians scored a one up 2 nothing at 9.37 of the second period. Uh, Ross Johnson and Arbor Jack, I got in a fight about 30 seconds later. Not much in it. It seemed like that was just a, hey, see if I can get the team kind of going thing. Uh, it did not. When the Canadians went up 5-0, uh, Brandon Jignac scores, makes it 5 nothing. This game is clearly over. There's a little over two and a half minutes left to play. Just run the clock out. Everybody go home. And then at that point, uh, Sam Carrick, agitated Jonathan Kovacevic of all people again for the second game in a row Kovacevic is the one getting in a fight okay annoying but fine it's the end of the game you're telling the other team you're not going to run around do whatever minute and a half later Adam Henrique is cross-checking Caden Gooley behind the play Gooley pushes off Savard pushes off Pizzetta and goes after Adam Henrique himself fights him and then you think, okay, now we are done. For whatever reason, Greg Cronin and the Anaheim Ducks put out their goon. They put Ross Johnston out on the ice. Uh, as the puck was dumped in at the end of the game, Caden Primo is standing there. He's got the puck on his stick, kind of waiting for the horn to go for his first career NHL shutout. And what should happen is that Ross Johnston comes flying into the corner. He gets into it with Jaden Struble, will not let him go. You have Arbor Jacki getting involved in this. You have Pizzetta and Gudis getting involved in this. And all I can think is uh, it ends with uh, Struble. Johnston is yelling something at him. I could not see what his mouth was saying. The camera was facing Jaden Struble, who was clearly telling uh, Johnston F you repeatedly before they were finally separated. We talk about the code and being respectful to other teams in these situations and remember that you want to be respectful even in a blowout because this is uh, the sport of champions and great gentlemen bull plop uh what the hell are we doing why i i get like the kovacevic and Carrick thing is one thing why are you putting out a guy who hadn't played since like the four minute or since his fight with jack eye in the second period Frank Corrado, whom I'm loving on TSM broadcast, was ripping into the Ducks. He hasn't played at all this period. He's barely played at all in this game. You know exactly what you were doing when you put him out on the ice. And that coach, in, in blind fury of the code, put him out there, and this is what happened. Laura, do you remember the 2021, was it 2020 or 2021, against the Philadelphia Flyers? 
uh, when the Canadians dared to put out a good power play unit in a blowout win over the Flyers and how Alain Vigneault filled his diaper about it. That's what coaches get mad about, but not throwing out a dude who plays six minutes a night to go out there and start fights in a blowout loss. I The whole code There's something thing... Wrong. There's something yeah. so backwards about this. It's so backwards. Like they get mad about like, do you remember when Nick Suzuki patted Carter Hart on the on the head? That was adorable. And now even nope, that that is not a joke I will make. I am apologizing for even thinking that in the back of my head is that Nick Suzuki did nothing wrong there in the first place. But anyways, yes, and everyone that lost their mind. A whole thing. Like we had to yeah. talk about it for two days. We had to talk about it. All the discourse was about that two days i make fun of it every time that they play philadelphia now but that's not the point <laughs> but yeah and and but this like this intentional harming of opponent players or intentional causing causing or like you know orchestrating orchestrating possibilities for the opponents to get hurt is how it's, i'm gonna put it it's pouring gas on a fire that doesn't need to be burning it's like it's like walking outside and seeing your grill having a little bit of an ember being like, well, I need to put that out and taking a bottle of lighter fluid and just spraying it straight into there. You know exact, and Greg Cronin is not an idiot. Uh, I know that any NHL coaches are dumb, but they are not, they are not as obtuse to think that I'm going to put this guy out there and it's going to calm things down. No, <laughs> you are absolutely know exactly aware of what they're doing. You know exactly what you were doing. You know exactly what he's going to do out there. And it's like, it'd be like if Sheldon Keefe played Ryan Reeves at all, you know, late in the game that it's a <laughs> blowout and he puts Ryan Reeves out there. You know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to take a run at somebody and he's going to do something dumb and it's going to cause an issue. And it's all we're going to talk about. Everyone gets so mad over these little agree things. Don't step on the logo. Well, don't put it on the floor. Don't take slap shots into an empty net. Don't, don't get blown out by the senators. But a coach putting, you know, his fourth line knuckle dragging goon out there, everyone just kind of goes, ah, it's just part of the game, I guess. Since when? If the Habs threw Jack Eye out there at the end of every game in which they wanted to send a message, people would roast the hell out of the team. And I would hope that everyone else would do that. It just brings it back to this whole code thing is like selectively applied to everything, which again just tells me it's a pile of crap that doesn't actually mean anything to anybody in this. Uh, Luckily, it doesn't seem like anyone was actually hurt. It Jaden Struble is more than capable of handling himself. It's just a kind of thing that, like, it's a lack of respect. Absolutely. That actually reads as a lack of respect to me is that you are willing to put someone out there who is going to go out there to try to hurt somebody versus just taking a loss in a game where you got blown out. And that to me is the is more disrespectful than any slap shot into an empty net at that point. No one gets hurt. Well, no one gets hurt in the action of the slap shot. In the aftermath, the jury is out. But uh, <laughs> nobody gets hurt on a slap shot. But you can get hurt when guys are going out there looking to start fights and cause an issue. For nothing. That's the whole thing. It's not like, you know, like one of their players was targeted in the head and this is retaliation. It's literally just to cause a kerfuffle. I keep wanting to swear on this episode and I keep stopping myself and I don't have a good enough vocabulary to, to like come up with a creative word. But I think you guys know what I'm thinking. Um, in the meantime, on tomorrow's episode, John from Locked On New York Rangers will be here. We will be doing a preview together of uh, the Rangers game. But what we really want to talk about is, you know, how each team is doing, uh, comparing certain experiences, comparing certain rebuilds and things like that. And we will get into that tomorrow here on Locked On Canadians. Um, so please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. You can email us at LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. We strongly encourage that. You can also leave comments in the YouTube. And if you want to bring up a mailbag question in the YouTube, just put mailbag question or MBQ at the beginning. So we do bring that up. We are on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. We are going to be expanding our social media presence. Uh, but in the meantime, you can follow us individually. I'm at the active stick everywhere. Scott is at Scott Matla everywhere. Thank you so much for listening. And we will talk to you next time.